Good day. The principal point of evolution for first-person shooters was the early 2000s. In this era, we had first-person shooters that had exceptional stories and rather complex gameplay. But then Halo was released and first-person shooting regressed to the point of shoot enemy. The game we're going to be taking a look at today is Raven Software's year 2000 masterpiece, Soldier of Fortune, a game that showed just how complex a game should be. Now the game itself gets its name from the Soldier of Fortune magazine. Essentially it was a piece of literature marketed to mercenaries. Essentially it talked about various merc operations and listed potential mercenary contracts. Essentially back when people were awesome, this was the questing board of its day. The magazine is surprisingly still in existence today, but it is not nearly as awesome as it once was, mainly due to the fact that there were several lawsuits filed against it. Essentially some people put out ads for contract killings, why the editor didn't see this and not cut it out, I couldn't say. And also, people tried to blame the magazine rather than the guy who put the ad in it. And why they did that, well, uh, people are stupid. Moving on. So now, let's lock and load and jump into Soldier of Fortune. The gameplay for Soldier of Fortune is first-person shooting at its finest. You can carry multiple weapons rather than just the paltry two, and you usually always have plenty of ammo for them. The levels, while linear, don't actually funnel you into one or two quarters, rather they allow you to explore quite a bit. And since this is a Raven Software game, you do get an inventory, and you can carry items ranging from C4 to grenades to health packs. Furthermore, you can interact with the game world quite a bit. Although so usually it's only through this rather ubiquitous button. Also, there are some points where you actually have to use your brain to progress. Basically, this is one of those FPSs where you have to find what part of a wall to shoot at to continue. Now, you don't always actually have to kill your enemies. Rather, you can disarm them by shooting the guns out of their hands. Now, this introduces a moral quandary of sorts. Essentially, do you shoot an unarmed man even though he was just about to shoot you? You might think this would be easy, but in fact, it is anything but. The difficulty for the game is also unique. You don't just have to choose from easy, medium, or hard. Rather, you can customize the difficulty variables, such as spawn rate, AI, and number of saves. As you can probably tell by this point, this game is very graphically impressive. When you shoot an enemy, you don't just see little blood puffs here and there. You see entire limbs blown off. The game itself uses a modified version of the id Tech 2 engine, and it goes without saying that it does look really, really good. But what Raven Software also used was the Ghoul Damage Engine developed by Raven Software themselves, and it is absolutely amazing. Remember back when I gushed about the bullet holes in the Far Cry review? Well, those have absolutely nothing on the Ghoul Engine. Let's face it, when you shoot someone with a shotgun, they are not just going to double over and bleed a bit. No, they're going to look like this. As one would expect, the ghoul engine was very controversial. Apparently, if you're going to kill enemies in the game, it has to look neat. And it also goes to show you that despite being somewhat graphically superior, modern FPSs are actually, in fact, a bit inferior, seeing as how no modern FPS has ever used this kind of damage modeling. Moving right along, the sound design is exceptional. All the guns sound really quite good, and the shotgun sounds like the hammer of the gods! The voice acting is what you would expect from an early 2000s FPS. It is hit and miss at times and generally just barely passable. Kill Saber, you've killed the game. Understood. John, take this entrance. I'll meet you at Station 6C. Good luck, Hawk. The music is also fairly generic as well and is mostly forgettable. Now, as we all know, the two most important elements of any first-person shooter are the enemies and the weapons, and in these respects, Soldier of Fortune definitely does not disappoint. Now, all the weapons are fairly standard. You got a pistol, you got a shotgun, machine gun, although I will say this is the best weapon in the game. The shotgun is powerful, but has absolutely pitiful range and scarce ammo. The machine gun, however, has a magazine that can hold 50 rounds and has plentiful ammo, and is really quite accurate and does quite a bit of damage. You then have the rocket launcher that works like you would expect. Then you have the bolt gun. Wait, 
bolt gun. Yes, you have this gyrojet rocket bullet launcher thing that is basically like the bolt gun from Warhammer 40k. But by far the coolest weapon in the game is the microwave gun. It's time to cook us some Hot Pockets! It is very powerful and surprisingly the batteries are actually fairly easy to find. Yes, you actually get plenty of batteries so that you can always have a nice microwave dinner. The enemies range from generic to absolute hilarious. Case in point, Duke Nukem. Well, you can't live on fame forever. You see, by the early 2000s, old Duke had spent all the money he made from Duke 3D and, well, he had to take a job at the Clone Factory. What made 80s action movies so great was the fact that while they could be serious at times, they were all incredibly goofy. And this worked quite well in making 80s action movies actually incredibly entertaining and memorable. Here, we have the same kind of story. We have a very serious plot, a terrorist organization has stolen three nukes, and you, John Mullins, Super Stash, must get them back. And in so doing, you fight ninjas. Fuck yeah! Ninjas! Let that sink in for a moment. You, the player character, actually get to fight honest to god ninjas. That just blows my mind on so many levels. But despite the fact that you indeed fight ninjas in the game, it still takes itself somewhat seriously. At the very least, the characters take the game seriously. Really, for 2000, this game has got to have one of the most well thought out and compelling stories of its era. And I mean its era as in all of 2000 to present. The characters are actually pretty good, if just generic 80s archetypes. You, the player, are given a tremendous amount of background on the world and motivations of the enemies. Hell, even your weapons are given background information. Now, from what I have read, this game is actually supposed to be based on the real-life adventures of real-life mercenary John Mullins. Supposedly, Raven Software brought him in as a consultant, but I think old Mr. Mullins must have exaggerated just a little bit. Why? Because this game story makes Commando look positively pedestrian by comparison. Where to even start? You, the player, are part of a mercenary organization known as The Shop, otherwise known as The Expendables, just without Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, and any of the other actors, but anyway. And as part of The Shop, you take various contracts to make money and to stop terrorists from destroying the world. In between missions, you actually go to the shop's hideout, which is located in this bookstore. And during this time, you actually have full control of your character. In addition to that, you actually get to choose your next mission. However, this is nothing more than a formality since you don't actually have a choice anyway. In order to access your next mission, you have to log on to the shop computer. The game starts up 80s style with the shop being called in to take out a violent street gang that has taken over a subway station. I cannot express just how dumb this is. No street gang would ever try to take over a subway station, bank, or anything. Why? Because it makes them highly visible and they become a target for the cops, the National Guard, the regular army, and apparently in this universe, mercs. But in all reality, they wouldn't have been able to hold this subway station for an hour, much less hours. And besides, they wouldn't have been able to fight off the cops or the National Guard anyway, so really, there would be absolutely no reason to call it a Merc team. But this being an epic FPS, some allowances need to be made. And besides, there is nothing more fun than rescuing civilians from hostile criminals. The next level is actually my second favorite. It is a train level, and for some reason train levels are just more fun than others. Although I couldn't say as to why, you're just fighting on a platform that is hurtling along at high speeds, and if you fall from it, you will die instantly. Oh, I just answered my own question. But anyway, one really awesome thing about this level is the fact that in order to take out the Chapa, you have to use a high-powered rifle to shoot the pilot. This, of course, requires a bit more skill than just missile spam and is all the more fun for it. The other levels in the game are fun enough, but then you have the Tokyo level, complete with the Yakuza and ninjas! Bloody ninjas! And these ninjas are actually pretty smart since they no longer just use katanas. Although they still have them, they actually carry and use MAC-10s. I just have to remark once again on the goddamn ninjas. Why can't modern first-person shooters be this creative and awesome? In many respects, the story for Soldier of Fortune can be seen as an ancestor for the modern war shooter. The elements are there, like terrorism and nukes. But this game actually handles this well. 
The game is actually fun! The story, while serious, is just so outlandish as to be gloriously cheesy, and the gameplay is actual gameplay you get into. And you actually get to kill different enemies instead of just the same reskins over and over again. Of all the classic games that I've played in recent years, this has got to be my favorite. Why? Because first-person shooters are very, very hard to come by these days. And it's just really refreshing to actually play an FPS that gets it right. And if, like me, you really want an FPS to play and you just are sick of modern FPSs, then this is a game that you might need to check out. And so this is General Loss wishing you a good Hexen 2, good Serious Sam 2, or whatever makes you happy.